Welcome to part two of this module. We just learned about whole number concepts related to addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So in this se section, we are going to work on whole number procedures and which procedures should be emphasized within intensive intervention when students require such, uh, such, inten such uh, intensive intervention. So in this part, we're going to focus on two concepts related to procedures around whole numbers, and those are the concepts of place value and regrouping. And then we're going to look at different types of algorithms. Algorithms are the step-by-step -step process to which students can solve addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division problems. So we're going to look at different types of algorithms that you might want to use within intensive intervention when it makes sense for you to use these with different types of students. So in this section, we're focusing on procedures of computation uh, for multi-digit numbers. Um, if you're really interested in how students uh, get answers to single-digit facts, those mathematics facts, that was in the fluency module that we talked about um, a, few, a few times ago in terms of instructional strategies. So today we're kind of going beyond mathematics facts to focus on multi-digit operations. So let's talk about these operations. So we talked about the concepts of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. And so we talked that addition it can be thought of as like a part, part, whole model. Addition can also be thought of as a join model. And all of the other operations have multiple ways for us to think about them conceptually. But now let's think about the procedures that we might use when we're presented with multi-digit problems uh, where we have to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Now, place value is a really important concept that a lot of students have difficulty with. Um, and so place value, if you want a good definition of it, we could call it the system by which the value of a digit is determined by the position it occupies relative to the decimal point. So let's look at this whole number here, 604. So this uh, number has three digit, digits in it. We have a 6, a 0, and a 4. The 6 is in the hundreds place. So this 6 doesn't represent just 6, it's actually 6 hundred. And this four is in the ones place. So it says that this number has four ones in it. So I have to be able to look at this number and interpret what does this six mean, what does this zero mean, and what does this four mean based on the place value of that digit. And a lot of students have difficulty with this because they've been exposed um, very often to single digit numbers and then we start to throw in double digit and triple digit numbers just like this one pretty quickly without providing a lot of place value background for students. So here are two other whole numbers, 16 and 2,309. Students should be able to name the place value of each digit, so be able to tell you what is in the thousands column, the hundreds column, the tens column, and the ones column. And they should also be able to have opportunities to use manipulatives to show you what these numbers actually mean. So I'm going to go over here and use the base 10 blocks, and I'm not going to do 2,309 because that's a really large number, and I actually didn't even bring that many blocks with me today. But I am going to focus on the number 16 and talk about some of the things we need to think about when setting this number up with manipulatives. So our number was 16. And when I'm working with the base 10 blocks, um, we have our rods, and you can call those tens. And we also have our units, we can call those ones. Um, things that we should not call these, these are not cheese straws, these are not french fries. We want to be mathematically precise with the language that we use with these manipulatives. So you should call them either rods and units or tens and ones. So let's go back to our number. Our number was 16. So 16 has one ten in it. So I would put one ten rod right there. And then 16 has six ones. So I'll place six ones uh, to the right of my, my tens. So here I have 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. 16 has one ten and six ones. Notice when I'm using the manipulatives to help students understand place value concepts, I'm placing the manipulatives in the order that the abstract number would be written. So if I were to write 16 below this number here, the 1 is here, so the 110 is uh, to the left of the 1s, and the 6 is here, which means the 1s are to the right of the 10. So this represents 110 and 6 1s, or the number 16. Now when we're showing other numbers with the manipulatives, and we'll go back to our, our, our place value mat here, 
Uh, when we're showing, it's really helpful to have a mat if you're doing anything, um, any numbers that use the hundreds or the thousands. Um, so here's an example place value mat that we've used with some of our students um, in, in intensive intervention before. And you can use manipulatives with this mat, but you can also just do representational drawings on this mat. So you can actually draw the hundreds, tens, and ones. Um, there's stickers that you can use. Um, and if you don't want to do the drawing, there's a lot of virtual manipulatives that you can use. Uh, just download download those on a tablet or a computer and you have a whole set of base 10 blocks that you can use very quickly to represent each of these numbers and the place value uh, within each of these numbers here. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on place value, but I just wanted to touch upon it here today to really make sure that when you are providing intensive intervention, that you're thinking about the student's strengths and weaknesses. And if they seem to have a weakness with interpreting numbers and interpreting the place value of numbers, you may want to really do um, more place value activities than your, your program provides for you. Uh, because we know the students struggle with place value very often, and so you might need to provide some additional support in that area. Another area for additional support while we're thinking about um, computational procedures is uh, how we actually set up our math when we're doing it on paper. So here's a problem right here, 46 plus 13. Now, um, this is an example that I chose just because it fits nicely on these slides. Um, but when students start to line up numbers that are triple digit numbers or quadruple digit numbers, a lot of these things that I'm going to talk about are very important to do. So it might not seem so important with double digit numbers, but it's going to become much more important later on with those larger set numbers. So students often with these abstract problems have a hard time keeping everything aligned. And so some of the things that we can do is that we can help students um, keep their keep their work lined up by having the students write on graph paper. So here you can see students put in one number for each space on the graph paper. Another uh, oldie but goodie is turning notebook paper sideways and then rewriting the problem there. So here I've got my tens column all lined up for me and then over here I have my ones column all lined up for me. I can also do a combination of those. So here's graph paper with a highlighter as to maybe where to start or where to end. And finally, I could do something, uh, and I've seen some teachers do this, where they'll use a bookmark to cover up uh, the column that you're not really focused on. So here I'm focused on the ones, and then I'm going to move to be focused on the tens. So what these ideas help us with is that once we are going to get into procedural algorithms, it uh, helps me organize my work. Because a lot of students may have misconceptions with like what's going on with the math, but a lot of students may just make mistakes with the organization of their mathematics. So we've got to help them get organized. And then another background thing that we may need to provide an intensive intervention, along with understanding place value and getting your work organized, is um, understanding the concepts of regrouping. So when we're thinking about regrouping, we can regroup 10 ones for 110 or 10 tens for 100. And I didn't put it on this slide, but we could also do 10 hundreds for 1,000. All right, so understanding that there's a go back and forth uh, between, between these tens and ones or tens and hundreds. Now, when I was in school, I learned this terminology as that means you're going to carry. But that is really just a procedural term that doesn't tell us about the mathematics. And so these days, we need teachers to use one of these three terms. So instead of saying, oh, I carry 10 ones for 110, which actually doesn't make any sense whatsoever, you would say, I regroup 10 ones for 110. I trade 10 ones for 110, or I exchange 10 ones for 110. Those terms make a lot more sense. They're more conceptually based, and they really tell the students what's going on between the tens and the ones. Carry doesn't mean anything like that at all. So that's why I covered it up. You can't even see it anymore, so hopefully it's out of your mind. With subtraction, we also have some regrouping things that we need to think about. So we've got 110 for 10 ones, or 100 for 10 tens. And probably some of you are used to this term borrow. I'm going to cover it up very quickly here because we want to make sure that students aren't saying borrowing. That doesn't make sense. It's a very procedural term. Instead, we want to focus on these conceptual terms of regrouping, trading, or exchanging. And what you will notice is that the terms that we can use in addition are the same as the two terms that we can use in subtraction. And I like that idea. I, that idea. It makes sense because I am. I'm regrouping 10 ones for 110. And the same way in subtraction, I'm regrouping 110 for 10, 10 ones. It shows the relationship um, among these different, different units of place value. 
So as we go today and we focus on some of these computational uh, algorithms, I'm going to really focus on using the correct language. So I'll most likely use the word regroup, but you remember you can also use the words trade and exchange. Now why are we focusing on all of this stuff around procedures? So when we're thinking about computational procedures, they really have to be taught in conjunction with the concepts of the operations. So in part one, we talked about the different ways to interpret addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. And now we're thinking of like, okay, for larger set numbers, what are some of the procedures that students have to learn in conjunction with those concepts that'll help make them a successful uh, mathematics student? So this is really just filling up your toolbox with more tools. You might use some of these tools with some students and other tools with other students, but the idea is that we're increasing your knowledge about this so that you can align the intensive in intervention instruction to fit the student's needs. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at different ways to solve these addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division problems. I'm first going to start with addition and I'm actually going to do some of these problems um, with you today. So when I went to school, I learned a standard algorithm for solving these problems, this problem here. So I have, um, let's see, 74 plus 18. Now the standard algorithm asks me to start in the ones column. And that's a little bit counterintuitive for students because we often, we read left to right and we uh, read a number line left to right and we read numbers left to right. But then all of a sudden we get to computation and we're like, ha ha, now you're gonna do everything right to left. So that's confusing for students, but if they can get into this pattern, we're always going to start here in the ones column. And I'm going to add these two numbers together. 4 plus 8 is 12. So I have a two-digit response. I always ask students, if your answer is more than 9, do you have to regroup? You, if your answer is more than 9, you have to regroup. So here it is. So I'm going to write the 2 of 12 right here. And you know what? That's a little bit misaligned. I'm going to rewrite that there. So okay, 4 plus 8 is 12. And then I'm going to regroup my 1 to the tens column. Now I've solved the ones column. Now I'm going to move to the tens column. Here I'm adding 1 plus 7 plus 1. 1 plus 7 plus 1 is 92. So when I add 74 and 18, my answer is 92. Now that's how I usually do my addition. That's probably how a lot of you do your addition. And that's um, how we teach a lot of students in schools to do their addition as well. But as an effective teacher who is going to provide intensive intervention, you need to have usually more than one strategy to help students understand this uh, computation uh, procedure. So there's another one that's used pretty frequently in schools, and some of you may have seen this strategy before. Others may have not, but I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate it now, and then we'll talk about the differences between these two strategies. So I'm going to add the same problem, 74 plus 18. Now this strategy is called partial sums. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the tens and write that partial sum. Then I'm going to add the ones and write that partial sum. And then I will add those partial sums together. I'll show you here what it looks like. Um, with partial sums, we start in uh, the, the left-hand column. So here I'm going to start in the tens column. So 7 plus 1. I'm not going to interpret that just as 7 plus 1, but this is 7 tens plus 1 ten. 7 tens plus 1 ten is 8 tens or 80. All right, so I'll write 80 right there. Now I'm going to add 4 plus 8. 4 plus 8 is 4 ones plus 8 ones, and that is 12 ones. So I'll write these that right there. So these right here are my partial sums, and I'm going to add those partial sums together. So 80 is the partial sum from the tens column, and 12 is the partial sum from the ones column. Uh, 8 plus 1, I have now 9 tens, and I could do this again. I could add 90 and 2 if I wanted to do that, or I could just go ahead and skip that when I add those partial sums together, my answer is 92. Now next we're going to look at the subtraction strategies. We're actually going to look at three of them. Um, but the idea here is that we're providing students with multiple ways to solve addition problems and then next subtraction problems and then after that multiplication and division. With these multiple ways, you're typically going to rely on the standard algorithm 
or the algorithm that your school uses uh, in, in their mathematics instruction. But as a teacher of intensive intervention, you need to have ways to help students understand the mathematics when this hasn't worked out. So if you're working with a middle school student who's tried this standard algorithm for a number of years and they're still having difficulty adding two digit or three digit numbers together, you may wanna actually try something different, partial sums, because maybe the student was having a hard time working right to left instead of left to right. Or maybe they were having a hard time understanding the place value within the numbers. So that's why we're introducing these. I'm not saying that you have to teach this method and this method, but when you're providing intensive intervention, you might want to use this or that. All right, so we just learned two algorithms for addition. Now we're going to learn three for subtraction. So we first have our standard algorithm. This is how I learned to subtract. It's likely how you have also learned to subtract. So here I'm going to subtract 315 minus 96. I'm going to start here in the ones column, and I have 5 minus 6. So I cannot subtract six ones from five ones, so I need to regroup. Notice that I didn't say that other word. I'm not even going to say it, all right? So I'm going to regroup here. I'm going to regroup one ten for ten ones. And I'm going to show my notation just like that. Some people may actually cross out the five and write the 15 above there. Uh, I would just always follow the notation that students see regularly in their textbooks in schools. And so now I have 15 minus 6. 15 minus 6 is 9. Now I move to the tens column. I cannot subtract 9 tens from 0 tens. So I have to regroup. I'm going to regroup 100. And now I have 10, minus, 10 tens minus 9 tens. That's 1. And then I move here to the hundreds columns. Two hundreds minus nothing is two. So when I have 315 and I subtract 96, my answer is 219. Now that's our traditional algorithm. That's how most students learn to subtract. But as you can see, I mean, this is just one example problem. There's a lot going on here, especially with the notation and the, with the regrouping. And if students are having a really difficult time with that, you might consider trying this algorithm right here. So this algorithm is related to the partial sums algorithm that we saw for addition. This one is called partial differences. Now partial differences works by crossing zero. So it uses a combination of positive and negative integers. That's what's difficult about partial differences. So if your students aren't ready for that, then just kind of follow along and uh, uh, like learn this algorithm, but you may not end up using it with your students. But for teachers who are working with students in the middle school grades or even high school grades, this might be a strategy that you might, uh, might actually employ. So we are going to do 315 minus 96. Here, just like with partial sums, we're going to work left to right. So first I'm going to subtract 300 minus uh, no hundreds. So 300 minus no hundreds is 300. I'm going to write it right there and line up at my 300 there. Now I'm going to move to the tens. 110 minus 9 tens is negative 8 tens or negative 80. And then 5 ones minus 6 ones is negative 1. So these are all my partial differences. The difference in the hundreds column is here, the difference in the tens column is here, and the difference in the ones column is here. So now I'm going to do 300 minus 80, that's three, uh, 220, minus 1 is 219. Now, there's a lot going on in that algorithm. Um, you are crossing zero using a combination of positive and negative integers, but it might help some students who have a lot of difficulty with this problem. Notice the difference in how this problem is notated with the standard algorithm versus the partial difference algorithm. Now there's one other one that we might try if students are having difficulty with multi-digit subtraction and this standard algorithm hasn't clicked and partial differences hasn't clicked, then we might want to use this add up strategy. Now remember when we were talking about the concept of subtraction, we can explain subtraction as taking away, that's kind of what we've been when doing here, but we can also think about subtraction as the difference between two amounts and comparing the difference. 
And if I'm thinking about the difference between two amounts, let's say I'm thinking about the problem 5 minus 3. I can think about that difference from starting at 5 and moving back to 3, or starting at 3 and moving up to 5. And so what we're going to do with this strategy, the adding up strategy, is we're going to think about the difference between two numbers, but instead of subtracting, we are going to add. So in this example, I'm going to start with 96 and add up to 315. So let me show you what that looks like. So I'm going to start with 96. And now I'm going to use friendly numbers for me. So I'm trying to get to 315, but let me get first get to 100. So I know 96 plus 4 is 100. All right, so I'm going to notate my 4 over here because that's going to help me out. This is what I'm adding up to to get from 96 to 315. Now I'm trying to get to 300. So I know 100 plus 200 is 300. And I'm still trying to get up to this target number 15, 315. Um, so 300 plus 15 is 315. So look, I've moved from 96 all the way to 315. So now I'm going to move over here to figure out what, like, what jumps did I make on my number line in order to uh, figure out the difference. So I am going to add 200 plus 4, that's 204, plus 15 would be 219. And looky there, I have the same answer with the add up strategy as the partial differences strategy as the traditional algorithm. So there's three different ways that students can think about subtraction. This is pretty fun. I'm just going to keep popping into this module with these different workbook activities because we changed them around a bit. So now let's think about workbook activity number five. Here you're going to solve an addition problem using two different algorithms. And once you finish with that, you're going to solve a subtraction problem using two different algorithms. All right, I hope you had fun with work, but that workbook activity. Now it's time to look at different types of algorithms for multiplication. So we're going to start as we have before with our standard algorithm. So now I'm going to multiply 26 times 17. So here I'm going to start, I'm going to multiply 7 times 6. 7 times 6 is 42, so I'm going to write the 2 of 42 here, and then I regroup my 4 to the tens. Now I'm going to do 7 times 2. 7 times 2 is 14, plus 4 more is 18, so I'll write 18 here below the equal line. Now it's time for me to multiply this 1, but it's not 1, it's 110. So I have to write a 0 here to hold place for now I'm multiplying by 10. So 110 times 6 is 6, and then 1 times 2 is 2, and then I'm going to add these together. So 2 plus 0 is 2. You can see that I still rely on the traditional algorithm. 8 plus 6 is 14, regroup my 1, 1 plus 1 is 2 plus another 2 is 4, so my answer is 442. So that's our standard multiplication algorithm. Now you can see it that I'm walking in front of it. But there's other ways that we can think about multiplying if this hasn't made a lot of sense for students. So let's look at this partial product strategy. So we've already looked at partial sums and we already looked at partial differences, so now it's time to look at partial products. So now I'm going to do my multiplication here, and I'm not going to start here with the ones, I'm actually going to start my multiplication here with the tens. So this is 1 times 2, but it's not 1 times 2, it's 110 times 2 tens. So 110 times 2 tens is 200. So I'm going to write that here underneath my equal line. Now I'm going to do 110 times 6 ones. 110 times 6 ones is 60, or 10 times 6 is 60. So these are my partial products from multiplication with this 110. Now it's time to do the multiplication with this 1. So 7 ones times 2 tens is 14 tens, or 140. And then 7 times 6 is 42. Now when I've put all these here together, I'm going to add them together for my product, but I have my partial products, 200 plus 60 
plus 140 plus 42. So 200 plus 60 is 260, plus 140 is 400, and plus 42 is 442. So I'll write my final product down here at the bottom, and guess what? We've solved that problem in the same way that we use the standard algorithm, just doing it in a different method. Now, a lot of students, especially middle school students who have math difficulty, seem to really benefit from this partial products model. But they actually benefit from um, setting it up in a slightly different way. And that gets us to our third uh, algorithm, which is our area model. So I'm going to leave this here uh, so, uh, so you can kind of refer back to it. But I want to show you another way that we can use the partial products, but in a setup that might be a little bit easier for students to, to digest. So and with the area model, I first have to draw um, a grid that I have a two-digit number by a two-digit number. So I'm going to buy, draw a grid that has two rows and two columns. If it was a three-digit number times a three-digit number, it would be three rows and three columns. Okay. So here I've got 26 and 17, and I'm actually going to set these up. Um, I'm going to do 26 first, and I'm going to set them up in expanded form. So that means I have 20 and 6, and I'm multiplying that by 17, which is 10 and 7. Now it's time to just do the multiplication. 20 times 10, 200. 6 times 10 is 60. Now before I finish, I just want us to look over to what we did over here. Are these the same partial products? Yes, they are. It's just set up in a way that might be a little bit easier for students, especially if they've got four uh, different rows or maybe even six rows of products to add together. Now 20 times 7 is 140, and 6 times 7 is 42. So what I do is I take these partial products, and I'll add them together. Here I'm going to just order them from greatest to least to make my adding just a little bit easier. So now I have 200 plus 140 plus 60 plus 42, and magically that answer is also 442. So just like we talked about with addition and subtraction, there are multiple ways of thinking about multiplication. And for students that have maybe learned the standard algorithm and they've, they've worked on it for several years and it's still not making a lot of sense for them, you might want to think about relying on this partial products model or this area model to help the students make a multi-digit computation much easier for them. All right, let's do some division. So we have two algorithms that we're going to focus on here today to solve this problem, 894 divided by 16. First, we're going to use our standard algorithm, or as everybody calls this, long division. So I'm going to start here with 16. I have to figure out how many times 16 goes into 8. I cannot make any groups of 16 with 8. So now I'm going to think about how many groups of 16 can I make with 89. Now, uh, I've solved this problem prior to doing this with all of you, so I know the answer to this, but this is where we see this type of work from students. And I'm going to write it over here because I think it's important to think about. So maybe like 16 times 5. So I'll do that first. Okay. Ooh, I'm close. All right. Maybe 16 times 6. 36. Ooh. Oh, okay. Went too far. All right. So it's 16 times 5. So I can take um, 5 groups of 16 with 89. 16 times 5 is 80. So I'll write that right here. And now I'm going to subtract. 89 minus uh, 80 is 9. Now it's time for me to bring down my 4. I can't leave it there because I've still not done dividing yet. And so uh, now how many times does 16 go into 94? Now, lucky for me, these numbers are, are pretty similar to the numbers we were asking about with our first division. And so I can't make six groups of 16. I can make five. So I'll write five up here about above the long division bracket. Five times 16 is 80. And now I'll do my subtraction. And I end up with 14. I cannot make any more groups of 16 and 14. So this will be my remainder. So my answer is 55 remainder 14. Now that's probably brings back some really lovely memories of you doing math in middle school. And that's what your middle school students are, are thinking about as well. 
But this long division uh, way of thinking about uh, doing division uh, can be really hard for students. The hardest part is always figuring out, well, how many groups of 16 can I make with these, uh, these different numbers here? And you'll, so that's why you'll see a lot of writing on the side just like that to help students answer that question. So there's another uh, strategy that we might want to use if this has been difficult for students. And that is our fourth and final partial, partial strategy of the day. Of the day, We learned about partial sums and partial differences, partial products, and now we're to our friend partial quotients. Now partial quotients is going to use friendly numbers. It's a little bit like that add up strategy that we thought about subtraction. So I'm going to think about, well, how many times does 16 go into not just 8, not just 9, but 894? So let me think here. So I know, if I know that 16 times 5 is 80, I know that 16 times 50, and I'm going to write it right over here on the side, is 800. So I'm going to go ahead and write this. This is part of the work that I have to do for this problem. So 16 times 50 is 800. Now I knew that. You might know that 16 times 40 is a number or 16 times 10 is a number. So students may end up using different partial quotients to solve this problem. So I've got uh, my 800, I need to subtract that. So now I end up having 94. Now I have to figure out how many groups of 16 I can make with 94. And let's say I just know off the top of my head that 16 times 3 is 48. Is it 48? <laughs> I have to check my work over here. 16 times 3. I'm questioning my uh, awesome, awesome mathematical prowess with no help from the peanut gallery over there. But 16 times 3 is 48. I'm going to do my subtraction here. I'm going to do some regrouping. And now I need to figure out with 46. Now I'm getting close. If 16 times 3 is 48, then I know that 16 times 2 is 32. And I'll do my subtraction here and I cannot make any more groups of 16. So now I'm going to focus on this part right here, because guess what these are? These are my partial quotients. And I'm going to add these partial quotients together to help me come up with my quotient. So 50 plus 3 is 53, plus 2 is 55, and I've got this 14 here. Remember, I couldn't make any more groups of 14, so I have 55 remainder 14. Now what's easier about partial quotients is that students can rely on friendly number knowledge to the student. So over here, I may have actually written 16 times 3, 16 times 4, 16 times 7. This is a lot of extra math that students have to do in order to answer this precisely. But over here with partial quotients, I end up relying on knowledge and many times it's knowledge around 5, 10, maybe 100, and then those partial quotients are added together to help me come up with my quotient. All right, now let's talk about workbook activity number six. Here you're going to solve a multiplication problem using two different algorithms, and after you finish that, you're going to solve a division problem using two different algorithms. It's time for workbook activity number seven. Here I want you to think back to the multiplicative schemas that we talked about in the module about problem solving. And then I want you to think about how could you use those two schemas to describe the problem on workbook activity number seven. All right, so why is all of this important? You as an instructor of intensive intervention, you need to have that toolbox full of as many strategies and practices as you can possibly have because you need to align your instruction with the student's 
needs. So we're working on all these computational strategies. I didn't say that you're going to teach all of those strategies to all of your students, but you need to know those strategies so that when students come to you and they're having difficulty with addition, division, subtraction, or multiplication, that you can help them out and say, well, why don't we think about it this way? Or let's solve this problem in a different way. So in modeling and practicing these alternate algorithms just may be helpful for some students, but remember, it might be confusing to others. So you're going to have to figure out when you're going to use those tools from your toolbox and when you're going to leave them in the toolbox. Now there's a few considerations we have before we finish this module. When all of these algorithms, when we were doing the addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, a strong understanding of place value is necessary. So those little snippets about place value that we talked about at the beginning, those might be need, uh, need to be emphasized again and again as students work on multi-digit computation problems. And then the other thing that we talked about at the beginning was regrouping or trading or exchanging, however you want to describe it, except you won't say those two words, carry and borrow. I know that. But you may want to think about providing some regrouping instruction in isolation um, before you're going to introduce the different algorithms that involve regrouping, or you might need to review regrouping as students practice the different algorithms. Because if you don't understand regrouping, solving all of those problems that we just worked on is going to be impossible. Another few things that we want to think about is that when we were doing all of that stuff with the multi-digit computation, we were relying a lot on fact knowledge. So I was zipping through those problems. Oh yeah, 6 times 7 is 42. So the stronger fact knowledge that students have, and remember we talked about fact knowledge in the uh, module on fluency, um, the better off they're going to be because they're just going to be more efficient with working through the different uh, steps to a computation problem. And all of this is also going to relate to better understanding of work with decimals, uh, so we'll talk about that in our next module. So let's look at our checklist for this part two. So remember our question was about what whole number procedures should be emphasized within intensive intervention. So we talked about as a teacher, you're probably going to need to teach place value concepts or review those concepts. You're also going to need to teach regrouping and use appropriate language for your regrouping. And then you as a teacher need to understand different algorithms for solving addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division problems. All right, so this part of our module is all about talking about alternate algorithms. And these are really helpful to use with students, especially students who've had mathematics difficulty and have struggled with solving multi-digit computation problems. So for the discussion board this time, I want you to suppose that in the next few weeks, you're going to teach um, addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division, um, some type of multi-digit computation. You get to choose which one of those operations you want to focus on. And you want to explain to a parent or guardian how to use an alternate algorithm. So maybe how to use the area model how to use partial sums, how to use partial quotients. And so your job is to take a picture and list the steps or make a brief instructional video explaining one alternate algorithm, just as you would try to explain this to a parent or guardian. And then upload that picture or video to, to share with your colleagues and you'll have a nice discussion about how could you actually explain this in a meaningful way so that if parents or guardians were to help their children at home, they would have a good idea of what you are also trying to teach within intensive intervention.